dhikr and I use the audio YouTube and recite along with it as I'm sitting listening and saying dhikr out loud uh, with the reciter. Uh, this morning I realized that when I was doing my dhikr my, my mind wandered and I caught myself. It makes me feel bad because then I'm not focused or concentrating on the dhikr and I'm just going along with the motions. My question is even as humans sometimes we can lose our concentration and focus and become distracted by the worldly issues that may be going on in our lives. When this happens, does our dhikr still count? Even though we may not have been fully concentrated on the dhikr at that particular moment or timing. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prescribed certain acts of ibadah upon us. And it is our responsibility to make sure to the best of our ability that we focus on these acts of ibadah with our full mind and our full heart. This is known as khushur. Khushur, it means focus and dedication and concentration on the act of ibadah, right? But as you mentioned in the question, we are human beings. There are certain times where our concentration may be distracted and this could be beyond our control. So when we find this happening, we should try to the best of our ability to refocus. When we catch ourselves losing our, our concentration, we should try to refocus on the ibadah that we are doing. But the fact that your mind wanders sometimes or that you lose your concentration or you know, your focus gets diminished at times, this does not take away from the validity of your ibadah. No, your ibadah is still going to be valid as long as you're trying your best, inshallah. And as long as you keep struggling with this, it becomes easier over time. So you may find a lot of distractions in the beginning of your journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when you first start making dhikr, when you first start praying, you find a lot of distractions. The shaitan is able to whisper into your mind and make you think of this and that, right? But you seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you find this happening, you can say, A'udhu billahi min ash rajim I seek the protection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the accursed shaitan. You can say this and you can refocus yourself and try to concentrate on the ibadah that you're doing. So in the beginning, yes, you may, you may struggle a lot. But as you go along, as, as you continue to fight uh, these whispers from the shaitan, things eventually become easier and easier and easier as you go along. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَالَّذِينَ جَاهَدُوا فِينَا لَنَهْدِيَنَّهُمْ سُبُولَنَا those people who struggle in our way, we will show them our ways. We will show them the right path. And surely Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with the people who do good. Right? So, yes, you may you know, lose your focus a little bit from time to time. That's okay, inshallah. Try to refocus when you find this happening to you. And your dhikr will be completely valid, inshallah. And keep doing it, inshallah. Keep, and, and, and keep at it. Don't give up. The, the goal of the shaitan in this type of a scenario is to get you to give up. Like, oh, I'm not able to concentrate, it's too hard, yeah, just forget all about it. This, this is the end game for the shaitan. This is what he wants. So do not let him have that satisfaction. Do not let the shaitan reach that goal. Rather, you have to struggle with your nafs, struggle with these whispers that may come to you, and try your best to focus. And la yukallifu Allah nafsan illa wus'aha. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not burden any soul beyond his or her capability. So you do whatever you can do and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will re reward you for that. And he will not take you to account for anything that's not in your control. Fattaqullaha mastata'atum. That keep your duty towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as much as you are able to do. So you do your best. You do everything in your effort to do it the right way. And whatever you cannot control, inshallah, you will not be held accountable for that. So keep doing your dhikr, keep upon the right path, and inshallah, you will be rewarded for this. The next questioner is asking, withdrawing blood while fasting, is it okay? If it's a small amount of blood, like for a blood test, for example, they take a little bit amount of blood for a blood test, then this is okay and it does not have any effect on the validity of your fast. Your fast is fine. But if it's a large amount of blood that is extracted, for example, if you, you have a blood transfusion, someone needs a blood transfusion and you donate a large amount of blood, you know, to donate blood to someone, for example, that, that, that needs an immediate transfusion, that's a large amount of blood that you're losing from the body. It's not a small amount like, like a blood test. So that does break the fast, right? And alhamdulillah, it is from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that that breaks the fast. Because a person who loses a large amount of blood if he doesn't eat or drink something, it may be harmful to his body. 
So it's from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that losing a large amount uh, of blood or, 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 or having a large amount of blood withdrawn from you uh, voluntarily, it breaks the fast. But if this happens by, by, by an unintentional means, like for example, someone gets, gets a wound, for example, they get cut or they get slashed or something accidentally. They have an accident and they lose a lot of blood. Then this does not break the fast. This does not break the fast, but if a person fears that if he doesn't eat or, dr or drink something, he may lose consciousness or he may faint or you know, something may happen because he lost too much blood, then he should break his fast. And he can make that fast up later. Yuridullahu bikumul yusr. Wala yuridu bikumul usr. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants ease for you. He does not want hardship for you. Right? So, in conclusion, if it's a small amount of blood that is withdrawn, like for a blood test, doesn't break the fast at all. If it is a large amount of blood that is taken out intentionally, then it does break the fast. If it's a large amount of blood that is lost unintentionally, then it does not break the fast. But if a person feels that he is in danger, then he should break his fast and make that fast up another day, inshallah. Next questioner is asking, is it permissible to buy and sell gold online on a daily basis with price fluctuations without having the gold in hand? No, this is not allowed. Because when you're, when you're selling gold, it has to be hand to hand. It cannot be like, oh, you give the money now and I'll give you the gold later. This is not permissible. And that's based upon the hadith where the Prophet wasallam said, الذهب بالذهب والفضة بالفضة والبر بالبر والشعير بالشعير والتمر بالتمر والملح بالملح مثلا بمثل سواء بسواء يدا بيد فإذا اختلفت هذه الأصناف فبيعوا كيف شئتم إذا كان يدا بيد. The Prophet وسلم, said that if you're trading gold for gold, or silver for silver, or wheat for wheat, or barley for barley, or dates for dates, or salt for salt, then it should be in equal amounts. Like if I have, uh, you know, 250 grams of gold, of new gold, 250 grams of new gold, and you have 300 grams of old gold, we cannot make a trade like this. It has to be an equal amount. It doesn't matter if it's old or new or whatever. The amount has to be equal. So I can only trade 250 grams of gold for 250 grams of gold. Mithlan bimithl. Right? And also sawa'an bisawa, equal for equal. Yadan biyad. And it has to be done hand to hand. It cannot be delayed. فَإِذَا اخْتَلَفَتْ هَذِهِ الْأَصْنَافِ if you're trading for something different in, in, in these categories, like for example, gold for silver, or, 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 or wheat for barley, okay? If, it's a, if you're trading something different, then it doesn't have to be equal amounts. So yes, you can trade you know, 20 grams of, of, uh, of, of gold for you know, uh, 300 grams of silver, or whatever it may be. It doesn't have to be equal then, but it still has to be yadan biyad. It still has to be hand to hand. It cannot be delayed. It has to be in the same, in the same sitting, right? So that's why selling gold online, uh, you know, selling or buying gold online, this is something that is not permissible because it, it's missing out on that hand-to-hand -hand transaction, right? So that's obligatory, so this type of thing would not be allowed. Next questioner is asking about zakat on stocks. How do you pay zakat on stocks? So it depends what your intention is when you bought these stocks. If your intention is to have a long-term investments where you're not planning to sell the stocks. You bought the stocks and you just want to profit from the dividends that are coming off of it. Then the zakat would not be paid on the, on the price of the stocks itself. It would just be paid on the profit that you are making off those stocks. Same thing uh, regarding real estate, right? If you bought a property and your intention is not to sell that property, your intention is to build upon that property and rent it out then you do not pay zakat on the value of the property. Rather, you pay zakat on the income that's coming in from the property, the profit that you're making on the property, the rental income that's coming in, that's what you have to pay zakat on, not the value of the property itself. But on the other hand, if you bought property with the intention to sell it, I bought a land and now I'm going to sell it for profit. This is your business. You're doing like a real estate business. You buy and you sell. You buy properties and you sell them. Right? Then you do pay zakat on the value of the property. So it's, it depends on your intention here. So stocks, it's the same thing. If you're doing trading in the stocks in and of it themselves, you're buying stocks and then you're selling them. Right? You're, you're buying stocks and then you know, when the price goes up, you sell those stocks. And then you buy more stocks 
and then you wait for the price to go up and you sell those stocks. So you're not trying to profit off the dividends of those stocks, you're trying to sell the stocks and make profit on the value of the stocks them themselves. You're, you're actually buying and selling the shares. So in this type of situation, then yes, you would calculate zakat on the value of those stocks, whatever the value of those stocks are. If you have it for a period of one year, then you would pay the zakat 2.5% on that. So it depends on your intention here. If you're keeping it long term, you're not planning on selling them, then you would pay the 2.5% on the, on the profit that's coming off of them, the, the dividends that come from them, if it reaches the nisab and you have it for one year. But if you're buying those stocks with the intention of trading in the, with the stocks in and of themselves, then you know, that's the same thing as, the, 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 the same ruling as cash would apply on those and you would actually calculate the value of those stocks after one year and you would pay 2.5% of the value of that. Next question is asking, how do, uh, do we take out zakat on a 401k? So there, there are many different opinions of the scholars regarding zakat on a 401k. So some of the ulama have said that you pay, you know, if, if, you had, if, you, if you have had value in that 401k for one year and it reaches the nisab or it's above the nisab, then whatever that value is, you pay 2.5% of zakat on it every year. That's one opinion. Another opinion is that you only pay zakat on the value that you would be able to benefit from if you cashed out. Because usually if you cash out uh, with a 401k plan, there will be a lot of fines and penalties if you haven't reached the age. There will be taxes that you have to pay. So you calculate all of that and you subtract it. So for example, let's say you had 500,000 in the 401k, but if you were to take it out today, then like, you know, uh, let's say, you know, 20% would go in taxes, for example, uh, another 10% would go in, 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 in fees and, and fines and penalties or whatever that is. So, so like 30% would be gone. The, ac the access that you have is only 70%. You will never have access to 100% of the paper value of that 401, okay? So some ulama said you only pay the zakat on what you would be able to access. So you wouldn't pay zakat on that whole 500,000, you would only pay zakat on the 70% that you would be able to access. So you would pay zakat on 350,000, right? That's one opinion. Then there's another opinion that you don't have to pay zakat on the 401k at all until you reach the age where you can withdraw without penalty because that is actually when you finally have full access to the 401k. Before that age, you don't have full access to it. It's kind of locked. I mean, you do have access to it, but it's a type of limited access because if you try to touch it, then you know, you're going to be hit with all sorts of penalties and fines and this and that, right? So you don't have like a full unrestricted access. You have a limited type of access. So some of the ulama have said like, no, zakat is only on money that you have complete full access to and you don't have complete full access to this, to this 401k until after you reach the, a certain age. So once you reach that age and you have full access, that's when you start paying zakat on it. Right? So that's one opinion as well. Then there's another opinion that for the 401k, you, if you are voluntarily making contributions to it, you're not, it's, it's not being automatically taken out of your paycheck but you, by choice, you, you sign into this and say like, yes, I want a certain amount deducted from my paycheck to go to the 401k. You did that by choice, then, and the company matches it, you know, you, you have no access to what the company puts in there, but you, you did have a choice to put what you're putting in there, right? So some of the ulama said, whatever you put in there by choice, you do pay zakat on that, but as for what the company is putting in and stuff, you do not have to pay zakat on that because you know that was not yours in the first place and you still don't have access to it because it's inside the 401k plan. So many different opinions regarding this and you know all of them have their reasons for these opinions. So whatever opinion you feel is safer to follow out of these opinions, inshallah, uh, you can go ahead with that. Next question is asking, is it allowed to get a vaccination while fasting in Ramadan? Yes, it is allowed to get a vaccination while fasting in Ramadan and this does not affect the validity of the fast. The fast is still 100% valid. The things that break the fast are things that go through your throat. So if you took medicine and it went through your throat, for example, it, it, you know, it, 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 you took it through the nose and it went to your throat, or you took it from the mouth and you swallowed it through the throat. This breaks the fast, right? But medicines that are taken uh, by injections they do not break the fast as long as they do not provide any type of nutrition to the body. Food and drink, these are, are things that, that give nutrition to the body. So if someone takes an injection 
that provides nutrition to the body, that gives energy to the body, that takes the place of food and drink, then that type of injection breaks the fast. But if it's a vaccination, vaccination does not provide any type of nutrition to the body. It's a medicine, does not provide any type of nutrition or nourishment to the body. So that does not break the fast. On the other hand, for example, if someone was, was, uh, was on an IV and receiving water through the IV line, right? Then does that give nourishment to the body? Yes, it does. That's actually taking the place of food and drink. So would, uh, would someone receiving the water through IV, would that break the fast? Yes, that would break the fast because that is actually giving nourishment to the body. But a vaccination is not the same thing. Vaccination does not give nourishment to the body, so it does not break the fast. So in conclusion, basically the rule is anything that comes through the, the, the throat, whether it gives nourishment to the body or not, it breaks the fast if it comes through the throat. Whether it gives nourishment to the body or not, it breaks the fast if it goes through the throat. If it does not go through the throat, if it's an injection, then it does break the fast if it causes nourishment to the body. It does not break the fast if it does not give nourishment to the body. So vaccines fall in the category of, of injections that do not give nourishment to the body. It's just a medicine that does not give any type of nutrition to the body. It does not take the place of food and drink. It doesn't go through the throat either. It's, it, it's injected. So it does not break the fast, and your fast would be completely valid if you take the vaccination, inshallah. Next questioner is asking, some people say that it is better to complete reading at least one Qur'an during the month of Ramadan. However, some scholars say it is better to read with understanding even if you don't finish. All right, so especially during the month of Ramadan, we should try to combine between reading a lot of Qur'an and also reflecting about, upon the Qur'an. As for reading the Qur'an, even if it's done without, uh, without knowing the meaning, there's a great reward in, do, in doing that. As the Prophet ﷺ said, مَنْ قَرَأَ حَرْفًا مِنْ كِتَابِ اللَّهِ فَلَهُ بِهِ حَسَنَةٌ وَالْحَسَنَةُ بِعَشْرِ أَمْثَالِهَا لَا أَقُولْ أَلِفْ لَامْ مِيمْ حَرْف وَلَكِنْ أَلِفٌ حَرْفٌ وَلَامٌ حَرْفٌ وَمِيمٌ حَرْف The Prophet ﷺ said, uh, whoever reads one letter from the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he will have one good deed. And one good deed is multiplied by ten. So it counts as ten. And then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, I don't say that alif lam meme is one letter. Rather, alif is a letter and lam is a letter and meme is a letter. So if you read alif lam meme, that's three hasanat multiplied by ten is 30, 30 good deeds. Just by reciting alif lam meme. Right? So recitation of the Quran as much as possible, especially during the blessed month of Ramadan, it is something that is that is highly encouraged and highly recommended. At the same time, the, the purpose of the revelation of the Qur'an is for, is for us to reflect upon it, to think about it, to ponder upon its verses, and to implement it in our lives. And we can only do that if we understand it and we know the meaning. So focusing on tafsir and reading the meaning and stuff, that's also something that, that should not be neglected. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Kitabun anzalnahu ilayka mubarakun ayatihi wa ulul albab that this is a book, this Qur'an is a book that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent down for the people to ponder upon its verses and it serves as a reminder to the people of understanding. Right? How do you ponder upon the verses if you don't know what the verses mean? Right? So, so, so reflecting on the meaning of the Qur'an, trying to understand it, that's also very important and it should not be neglected. So during the month of Ramadan, try to combine both of these things. Read as much of the Qur'an as you can and also spend some time reflecting upon it and, and, and pondering upon its meaning. So you don't have, one of these things does not have to suffer at the expense of the other. You, you should try to strive to do both. Read as much as you can, as much as possible, and at the same time, try to ponder as much as possible as well, especially during the month of Ramadan. Next question is asking, I know there are sunnah things to do once a baby is born, but why do we need to do these things? All right, the first and foremost answer to this question when, when we ask, when, when, when it is asked, why do we need to do these things? Because the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us to, that's it. You don't, you don't need more of an explanation than that actually. Because Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu ati'u Allah wa ati'u rasul O you who believe, obey Allah and obey His Messenger. So by obeying His Messenger, we have obeyed Allah. May yuti'u rasul faqad ata'a Allah. Whoever obeys the Messenger, this person has obeyed Allah. So. If the Prophet وسلم, in his guidance, he has shown us or he has told us to do something, we say, wa We hear and we obey, whether we understand the reasoning behind it or not. 
It doesn't matter even if we don't understand the reasoning behind it. If the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us to do it, we do it. And we know that it's good for us even if we don't understand why. So that's the first and foremost reason. Like sometimes people ask, why is pork haram in Islam? Someone might ask a Muslim, a non-Muslim might ask a Muslim, uh, why is pork haram in Islam? Even maybe Muslims might even ask this. Why, why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make pork haram? Right? And then you'll see sometimes, you know, some, some people will try to come up, they, they will say like, oh, you know, science has discovered that, you know, pig is very unhealthy and it's this and that. All right, yeah, that's secondary. But the first and foremost reason why we don't eat pork is because Allah said not to eat it. That's the reason why we don't eat it. Whether we know why or don't, whether we understand the reasoning behind it or not, that's, that's all secondary. The primary reason why we don't do it is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us not to do it and that's actually enough for us. We don't even need the secondary reasoning as Muslims, right? So that's first and foremost. So why do we need to do these things once a baby is born? Because the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam showed us. That's, that's, the, that's the primary answer. And as for these things, when a baby is born, we can see some of the hikmah behind it as well, alhamdulillah. When a baby is born, what... What is, is one of the first things that, that is supposed to be done? The adhan should be recited in the right ear of the baby. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. Ashhadu anna Muhammad rasulullah. Ashhadu anna Muhammad rasulullah. Hayya ala salah, hayya ala salah, hayya ala al-falah, hayya ala al-falah. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, la ilaha illallah. When the baby comes into this world, this is the first thing he's supposed to hear. Don't you think this will be beneficial for the baby? Having such, a, such a, a strong foundation in the first moments of his or her life outside the womb of his or her mother? Hearing about the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the fact that there's no one worthy of worship except Allah. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is the messenger of Allah. Hearing these words of tawheed, that's the first thing that a baby hears when he comes out, right? There is, there's definitely benefit in this. Inshallah, this will be a strong foundation for what is to come. Also from the sunnah is to shave the hair of a baby and to weigh the, the amount of hair, weigh, see what is the weight of the hair and give that amount of silver away as sadaqah, right? So this is also that's something that's very beneficial, a, a good tradition that the Prophet wasallam taught us. And it's a sign of thankfulness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as well. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granted you with a child a great blessing you know, so, you know, giving away sadaqah after this event, this is something that shows your gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Shouldn't you be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for giving you this gift, right? Having an aqiqah for the baby, this is also something that's very beneficial. And it also shows your gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You sacrifice an animal or two animals and, you know, you distribute the meat to the people. Doesn't this show your gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as well for granting you with a child? Right? So alhamdulillah, there are, there are benefits that we can actually see as well. But even if, we, couldn't, even if we, we didn't see these benefits, even if we couldn't understand these benefits, it is enough to know that our Prophet ﷺ instructed us to do these things. Next questioner is asking, if chicken is hand slaughtered and bismillah is, re is verbally recited by the slaughter man, but the chicken are given a low voltage water bath to prevent the birds from harming themselves and are alive at the time of slaughter, is this halal? Does giving a low voltage water bath come in the guidance of it being halal? As long as the chicken was still alive, even if it was given a low voltage water bath, as long as it's still alive at the time of slaughter, as long as it had, hasn't died by the time it's, it's cut, then uh, it would still be halal. So the condition is that the chicken should still be alive and the man who's, uh, who's slaughtering it should say bismillah and he should slaughter it in the correct way. Then it would be halal even if it did go through a low voltage water bath. Is this the best type of practice to follow? No, ideally it's not. Ideally it's not, right? To, to even to give, you know, to, to use electricity, uh, you know, to make it easier to slaughter the animals. Ideally this should not be done, but it does not make it haram. It does not make the, the final product haram as long as the animal was still alive when the slaughter was done. Next question is asking, when dreaming of a deceased loved one, how do you know if it's a true dream and not your thoughts? All right. This is something that you would not necessarily know for sure. If you're thinking of someone a lot, someone who has passed away a lot, you know, one of the types of dreams is based upon things that you're thinking about, psychological dreams, like you're thinking about something a lot and in the night you have a dream about that. That is one type of dream, just based upon your thoughts. And then there are dreams that are from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then there are nightmares, bad dreams that come from the shaitan. So there are three types of dreams. 
right? So if you see uh, a person who has passed away, a deceased loved one in your dream, it is possible. It is possible that, you know, your souls are actually meeting. This is a possibility. Because when a person is sleeping, his soul is lifted out of his body. And as for a person who dies, his soul is also out of the body. So it is possible for the souls that are outside of the body to meet each other. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allahu yatawaffa al-anfusa hina mawtiha wallati lam tamut fi manamiha. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He raises up the souls of the people who die. And as for those who do not die, He raises up their souls when they sleep. So is it possible the souls that are lifted from the sleeping people can meet up from the souls that have been lifted from the dead people and they can meet? Yes, it is possible. It is possible. We cannot say this has happened. When a person sees a deceased loved one in their dream, we cannot say for sure that you know, their souls have met. But it is a possibility, yes, that their souls are meeting. And what's your opinion if a deceased loved one gives advice about living matters, especially what to do with the deceased's wealth? Okay, so there's a, there's a, there's a very important principle. Al-ahlam la tubna alayha ahkam. Right, that no rulings can ever be derived from dreams. You can never derive any type of rulings of the sharia from dreams. Right, the revelation that came to the Prophet sallallahu is complete. After the Prophet ﷺ passed away, revelation has stopped. So you cannot base any type of rulings on dreams that you have, right? That's a very important principle. So, you know, if you see someone in your dream and they're telling you, do this with your, my wealth and do that with my wealth, and, right? If it's something that is not permissible, if it's something that's haram, then of course you cannot do it. If it is something that is permissible, if it's something that is permissible, Right? Let's say you inherited a certain portion of, of wealth from, from this person and then you see this person in a dream and they're advising you do this and this and this with the portion of wealth that you inherited from me. You know, if it's something that's good and you want to do it and you think that it's beneficial, you can do it. But you are not obliged to do that based upon what you saw in a dream. If, if it seems like a good idea and you think about it and it seems beneficial and you want to do it, you're, you're free to do it as long as it's halal. But... Just because you saw it in a dream does not obligate you to do anything. So remember this rule. Al-Ahlam la tubna alayha ahkam. That uh, rulings cannot be based upon dreams. Next question is asking, when reading the Quran for a deceased loved one, is it okay to read as a family just to give motivation to all while also bringing them closer to the deen? All right. As for reciting the Quran and, you know, asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant the reward to a person who has passed away, if this is done on an individual basis, then inshallah there's no problem in doing this. Like if you're just sitting at home and you recite some portion of the Quran and you ask Allah, Ya Allah, give, this, give the reward of this to my deceased grandmother or grandfather or whatever you want to do, that's okay, inshallah. But as for gathering and doing this as a group, this can be considered a type of innovation, right? Because uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam never made these type of gatherings for his companions that passed away during his lifetime. Many of his companions passed away during his lifetime. His uncle Hamza radiallahu an, other companions that were very close to him, they passed away. But is there any narration of the Prophet ﷺ gathering the people and, and you know, assigning one Jews to each, per, each person and say, you, you know, you recite, each one of you recite this portion of the Quran and grant the reward to this person? The Prophet ﷺ never did this. When the Prophet ﷺ himself passed away, did the Sahaba radiallahu anhum do something like this for him? No, they did not, right? So making these type of, of gatherings can be considered a form of innovation. But if someone is just doing it on their own without any prior coordination or without any type of pre-organization for this, they're just doing it on their own, then inshallah there's no harm in doing that, inshallah. Next questioner is saying, my parents provide for me financially, but if I have savings in cash, even if I don't have a job or any other source of income, do I have to pay the 2.5% of the total amount towards zakat? Who is eligible to pay zakat and who is eligible to receive zakat? All right. So if you have savings that are at or above the level of the nisab, which is 85 grams of gold or 595 grams of silver, whatever is the lower value of that if, you're, if your assets are in cash, and of course, these days, 595 grams of silver is, 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 is worth much less than 85 grams of gold. So you would ba if, if your savings are in cash, then you would base it upon the lower number, which is the 595 grams of silver, which is these days, it's worth about 480-something dollars. So if you have had that amount of money, 
worth 595 grams of silver, these days about 481 or 482 dollars, and you have had that for a period of one Hijri year, then you would have to pay 2.5% of zakat on that, right? Whether you have an income, whether you have a streaming income, whether you have a job or not, doesn't matter. As long as you have had the nisab or above the nisab throughout the whole year, and it never dipped in that year below the nisab, that's important too. If it dips below the nisab any point, at any point throughout the year, and then it comes back above the nisab again, then the year starts all over again. The year starts all over again from the point where it, where it started the nisab. So now you have a whole year from that point to pay, right? So if you have had the nisab constantly or more than the nisab for a period of one year, then yes, you would have to pay 2.5% of that as zakat. And the second question is related to that. I'm a 16-year-old teenager and I have a savings of $720. Should I pay zakat? If you have had this $720 for one year, and it never dipped below the nisab. And as we mentioned, the nisab these days, 595 grams of silver, about $480. So if it never dip, dipped below that money, you've had $720, and let's say you've had it constantly throughout the year, then yes, you would have to pay 2.5% on that after one year has passed from the time that you got it in your possession. And it's not much, 2.5%, 2.5% of uh, $720. It's going to be, le your zakat that you have to pay on that is going to be less than $20. It's going to be less than $20. So it's not something that's difficult to do, inshallah. All right, the next question, are, these are the last couple of questions, and they're all related. Uh, these three questions are about niqab. Can you discuss the ruling of niqab? I know that some scholars say that it's fard, and some say that it's mustahab. Uh, what are the evidences? All right. So regarding niqab, that's a woman covering her face. Is it? Is it obligatory for a woman to cover her face uh, or not when she's in front of non-mahram men? So this is a matter where there is a difference of opinion amongst the ulama. The Shafi'is and the Hanbalis say that uh, the face of a woman is part of her aura and she must cover it when she is in front of non-mahram men. And as for the, the Hanafis and the Malikis, they say that uh, the, the, the face in and of itself is not considered part of the aura and it is not uh, obligatory for a woman to cover her face unless there is a fear of fitna. If she's in a place where she fears that, you know, there could be fitna, it could, it could cause temptation or problems, you know, if her face is uncovered, then she would have to cover her face, right? Uh, so yes, it is a matter of difference of opinion and, you know, each camp, each, each, uh, each opinion, they have their reasons and they have their evidences for this opinion. As for those who have the opinion that it is obligatory. They use the uh, the verse of the Quran as evidence where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, says, Wala zinatahunna illa ma zahara minha. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about the believing women that they should not uh, show their beauty except what is apparent. And some of the Mufassireen have interpreted what is apparent means just basically what can be seen if they are fully covered. Like you can still you can still see that, okay, there is a woman here, even if she's fully covered. That is what is apparent, you know, how she looks when she's fully covered. So she is allowed to go out in front of non-mahram men, basically, but she has to be fully covered. That is one opinion. That is one of the evidences that, that they use uh, to say that it is obligatory for a woman to cover her face. They also, they use the evidence where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhan nabiyu, qul li azwajika wa banatika wa nisa al-mu'mineen yudneena alayhinna min jalabibihin. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands the women, the believing women, to wear the jilbab and bring their jilbab close to them. And the jilbab is, a, is an outer covering, uh, an outer garment basically they, that, starts, that starts from the head and goes all the way down. So they say that the, you know, the jilbab also it would cover the face as well. It's, it starts from the head and it goes, it's, a, it's a garment that starts from the head and, and goes all the way down to the ground. Right, so they use this as an evidence that's, uh, to show that the, you know, the face is obligatory to be covered as well. All right? Now, the other, the other opinion that it is not obligatory for a woman to cover her face, they have evidence as well. And there is the, there is the hadith that is found in the Sunan of Abu Dawood, where the Prophet wasallam, once he saw uh, Asma bint Abi Bakr, Asma, the daughter of Abu Bakr, the sister of Aisha radiallahu anha, Asma had come to visit Aisha. Aisha was the wife of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So her, her sister came to visit her and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam saw and Asma, the older sister of Aisha radiallahu anha, she was wearing some clothes that was, that was, it was thin clothing, right? It was thin clothing. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam looked away 
And he said to her, Ya Asma, Inna al mar'ata idha balagat al mahida lam yasluh. That when a, when, Ya Asma, when a woman, when she reaches the age of puberty, then uh, it is not appropriate. Lam yuslah an yura minha illa hadha wa hadha wa ashara ila wajhihi wa kaffihi. That he said, yeah, he said, Ya Asma, when a woman reaches the age of, 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 of puberty, then it is not appropriate that anything should be seen of her, except for hadha wa hadha. And he pointed to his face and to his palms of his hands. So those who say that covering the face is not obligatory, use this narration. That the Prophet ﷺ, he specifically exempted the face and the palms from the, 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 the ob obligation of covering. Right, so that, and Shaykh al-Bani rahimahullah, he said that this hadith is authentic. Right, so they have their evidence as well. And they, and they say about the verse where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا يُبْدِينَ زِينَتَهُنَّ إِلَّا مَا ظَهَرَ مِنْهَا That they should not show their beauty except what is apparent of it. They interpret illa ma zahara minha, what is apparent of it. They interpret that as the face and the hands. That is what is apparent of it, right? So, you know, both sides, they have their evidences, they have uh, their reasoning, and there are two opinions uh, amongst the scholars regarding this issue. All right, so a related question he's asking here, if a wife believes that it is mustahab, while the husband believes it's fard, should he use his authority as a husband to command her to wear it so that it becomes fard for her because obedience to the husband in what is permissible is obligatory, or should this be avoided since it can lead to negative feelings? Is he considered a day youth if he doesn't do so? All right, so this is a bit of a complicated question. If the wife and the husband have a difference of opinion on this, on this issue, the wife believes it's not obligatory, but the husband believes it is obligatory. So can he command her to wear it? And if he does command her to wear it, does she have to wear it? All right, so there are, there are two opinions about this as well. Does the wife have to obey her husband in this if she herself does not believe that it is obligatory, but he believes that it is? So in one, uh, one opinion is that the husband, he does have the right to enforce her, uh, enforce this upon her, and she has to obey him. This is one opinion uh, because he believes that it is obligatory and he is allowed to order her to do things as long as she doesn't believe those things are haram. So even a woman who believes that covering the face is not obligatory, even if the woman believes it's not obligatory for her to cover her face, there's no one who would say that it is haram to cover the face. Even those women or those people who say that it's permissible to uncover the face, they will not say that it's haram to cover the face. So if your husband is commanding you to cover your face, he's not commanding you to do something that is haram. So as long as it's not haram, the woman should obey her husband. Based upon the hadith where the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Ida sallat al mar'atu khamsaha wa samat shahraha wa hafizat farjaha wa ata'at zawjaha qila laha udkhul al jannah min ayy abwab al jannati shi'ti." That if a woman prays her five prayers and she fasts during the month of Ramadan and she she keeps her chastity intact and she obeys her husband. And then it will be said to her, enter Jannah from any of the gates of Jannah that you wish. So obedience to the husband, it is obligatory. And as long as he's not commanding her to do something that she considers haram, she does not consider it haram to cover her face, even though she doesn't consider it obligatory, she's not saying that it's haram. So it would be obligatory for her to obey him. And he would have the right to command her to do that. This is one opinion. There's another opinion where he does not have the right to command her to do something that she does not consider to be obligatory. If she really doesn't consider it to be obligatory, then he shouldn't command her to do something that she, he can advise her and he can try to convince her, but he can't force her to do it. That is also an opinion. And Ibn Qudama, rahimahullah, one of the great Hanbali uh, faqihs, one of the great uh, uh, scholars of the, of the Hanbali madhab, he mentioned something similar. He mentioned if a man is married to a woman who is from Ahlul Kitab, a man is married, a uh, Muslim man is married to a Christian, woman, for example, which is permissible, right? And according to the Christians, Christians in their religion, they do not consider it haram to drink something that has alcohol in it. So does the husband, if, if the wife, she's a Christian and she's, she's drinking something that has alcohol in it, the husband who is a Muslim, does he have a right to stop her from drinking that or not? So this is a matter of difference of opinion. Some scholars say, yes, he has a right to stop her. And others have said like, no, you know, according to her, according to her belief, she does not consider it haram, so he does not have the right to stop her 
from doing that. So basically a similar thing would apply here, right? So there are two opinions here. One opinion is that, yes, the husband does have the right to enforce it on her even if she does not believe it's obligatory and she must obey him and she must cover her face if, even if she doesn't believe it's obligatory. She has to do it because her husband told her to do it. That is one opinion. Another opinion is that he does not have the right to, to force her to do that if she does not believe herself that it is obligatory. So two opinions here. And, you know, this is something that should definitely be discussed before the marriage so it doesn't cause problems, right? You should be on the same page. Right, the husband and the wife, before marriage, this should be discussed and you should make sure you're on the same page before any of these things happen because it, it has the potential you know, to be something that, that causes a lot of problems between the husband and the wife if they don't agree on this type of an issue. And inshallah, no, the person would not be considered the youth in this type of situation because it's not like he's, he's happily allowing his wife to go out and you know, uncover herself and be immodest. No, it's not like that. You know, she is doing this. She's not covering her face based upon what she believes is appropriate, what she believes is correct. She does not believe that it's obligatory, right? So if she's going out uh, you know, and she's covering herself, she's dressing modestly, but she's not covering her face because she does not believe it's obligatory, then inshallah, no, you would not be considered as the youth, inshallah. And by the way, the youth, it means like a, a man who doesn't care if, you know, uh, other men see his women or this. Uh, you know, he doesn't have any protective jealousy over them. And, you know, the youth is someone who is, who is, who is highly, uh, you know, h highly criticized in Islam. A person, a person who really doesn't have any type of, 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 of uh, doesn't have any type of protective jealousy or honor towards his women. Right? So there's a severe warning, a severe threat against the, the youth. Right? So, inshallah, no, this person would not be considered a, a day youth, right? Because his, his wife is not, uh, you know, intentionally being immodest, right? She's doing what she, she feels is permissible, right? So, it, it, it would not go to the level of him being considered the youth, inshallah. Okay, now he's mentioned, the last question here. He's mentioning if it's the other way around. If the husband believes it's mustahab, husband believes it's not obligatory to wear the niqab, but the wife believes it is obligatory, does he have the right to tell her not to wear it? And does she have to obey him in this type of situation? Now, this is different because she, according to her understanding, she believes it is obligatory and she believes it's haram if she uncovers her face. So in this type of situation, if the husband is commanding her to take off her niqab or to, to uncover her face while she believes it is haram for her to uncover her face, then she should not listen to her husband in this situation. Because there is the hadith where the Prophet وسلم, said, لا طاعة لمخلوق في معصية الخالق. There is no obedience to a creation if it involves disobedience to the Creator. So if the woman believes it's obligatory to cover her face, if she really believes that, and her husband is telling her to uncover it, and she listens to him, then basically according to her own understanding that she is disobeying Allah by uncovering her face, and she's obeying her husband. Right? So if she really believes it's obligatory to cover her face, then even if her husband tells her to uncover it, she should not uncover it. Because her obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, according to what she believes is correct, that is more important than obeying her husband. But once again, as I mentioned, you know, these things should be sorted out before the marriage to make sure that both the husband and the wife are on the same page, inshallah. That concludes the questions for today. Barakallahu feekum. Wallahu a'lam sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, as for the prayer timings for tomorrow, there, is, there, there are a few changes. Uh, Salatul Fajr will be at 5.30, the Iqamah, and starting from tomorrow, Isha will also be at 9 o'clock. And the Ramadan timetable will be out tomorrow, inshallah, and you know, we, will, we will adjust the, the prayer timings accordingly. But for tomorrow itself, inshallah, Fajr at 5.30, and uh, Isha at 9 o'clock. Jazakumullah khairah.